so much, Pastor Bish, and it's a privilege to get to be here today. Uh, I know I watched uh, last week's message on YouTube, and I know it was an emotional week for everyone. And then, of course, I get to come here and, and, and preach today. So I'm the one who gets to take what, whatever the brunt of the emotions is. Here I am today, the, the, the difficult week of following up that, right? And then Bish says, hey, Logan, you come and you do it. So thank you for that. Um, I'm interrupting your series on faith. Pastor Bish is going to finish that, I believe, next week. Uh, so I'm interrupting your, your series on faith today. Uh, but it's a privilege to be here, as he mentioned, from uh, Minnesota, a church called River Valley. And uh, we were out here. I was able to meet many of you, of you guys um, a few months ago when Pastor Kirk and I were out here. And just there was an immediate connection. We felt like there, there are places that you go, and maybe you've experienced this before, where you meet somebody that you've never met before, but you feel like you've known them your entire life. And that's exactly how it felt here. And uh, hearing all the things that have been happening and just the, the excitement and the opportunity that is here in the church is there, it's a new beginning, right? And um, it's, it's a challenging one nonetheless, but I think that there's an opportunity and that's what I wanna talk about today is this opportunity that we have as a church, that Life Church has as a church to do greater things than it's ever done before. And uh, the amazing thing, and I was talking to several people about this with the Bassins and Andreas and Armory, and they've been able to be with us. And Angio was at our church for the last year. And so it was amazing to get to know him. But in talking with them and even talking to people here, it's unique because sometimes in the business world, and maybe you've been this way, maybe somebody has left your company or somebody uh, has, has gone to a competitor, right? There's an attitude of almost, I hope that they fail. You know, I hope that they go out there and that, that we do better than them and that we serve them right to say, yeah, you should have never left. And what's so unique about the kingdom is it's the exact opposite. Right, when we follow in his obedience, we believe, as Andreas has said, as Bish and Haley have said, that we believe that greater things can exist both here and in Oklahoma and in Minnesota, that his kingdom has enough for all of us. And this is something that we share often at River Valley is that we don't serve a God who divvies up the pie and gives someone a bigger slice than the other. We serve a God who's the ever expanding universe creator. And so I'm believing that... Um, the future of this church is far greater, that the future of the church in Oklahoma, in Cornerstone, that the future of River Valley, that the future of all God wants to do here in Vancouver, across America and around the world is greater because it's his kingdom and he cares about his church far more than we do. And so if you trust that with me, I wanna just continue in that and challenging us to step into this. And so uh, before that, I do wanna share a little bit about my family. I believe you have a, a picture of my family that we can throw up on the screen. Uh, this, is, this is my family, and uh, actually in a month's time, my dad, who's the lead pastor of our church, will actually be here. And so excited for that. I believe it's what, June or July 9th or July, July 9th, so make sure to mark that down. He'll be here. He'll be preaching, so I'm excited for that as well. But on the, uh, the, your left, my right, uh, my brother Connor and his wife Alexia and our new nephew, Beckham, he's uh, just over three months old, an amazing gift to our family, the first grandchild for my parents. And then my mom, Becca, who's a pastor on staff, oversees our women's ministry. And uh, they planted the church uh, 20, it'll be 28 years ago in September. And so I'm 20, we'll be 27 next month. So I've been a part of the church my entire life. I've never attended another church. And so I've loved being on the team coming up on seven years on staff as a pastor. But as you know, as pastor's kids, you do whatever is needed to be done. And so I did that throughout the, the time growing up. Didn't think I'd go into ministry, but as the Lord would have it, uh, I was sucked back in. And of course, my wife, Mac, who's here with me today, it's amazing to have her here. And she wasn't able to join me. Like, yeah, we can give it up for Mac. For those who know us, if you could clap for one of us, it would certainly be for her. Um, but she wasn't able to be with me last time and so excited that she gets to experience Vancouver. The only other place she'd been in Canada was Montreal. And so that's French Canada, totally different. And so excited to have her here with us. And then of course, we had to take advantage of our time here. And so the next few days we'll be going up on vacation or as you would say, holiday up in Whistler. So we have to experience all that British Columbia has to offer. And so excited for that. And obviously just wanna honor all the, the amazing legacy that has happened here throughout the many years from Numa to Life Church and just believing that the best will happen. And uh, we, the reason why we're here even 
The reason why even I'm speaking today is because of the belief that we have in Bishop Haley. And there is so much belief in even meeting you and seeing you and, and how you lead worship, how you lead people, the, even the conversations that we had several months ago before all of this was even happening, hearing the, the way that people would speak about you and the way people speak about your family and Leo is there is a, an excitement and an expectation of people that are leaning in and wanting to serve under your leadership. And so for us, all our role is is to help lift your arms and to help be champions for you. And I believe that's the role of this church as well that we're gonna talk about today. But truly, uh, Bishop Haley, we believe in you so much and there's no one that is better to lead Life Church than you all. Can we thank them for stepping in the first official week of being lead pastors and there's no one better to do that. But uh, I wanna t talk today and uh, speak from the book of Galatians. And the book of Galatians is in the New Testament. And in a moment, I'm gonna read the scripture, but some context behind uh, Galatia. It's a region in modern day Turkey. And at the time, there was a lot of people that were going that were Jews that were converting to Christianity, right? In the first century, Paul is writing about this. And there were some Jews there that were convinced that it wasn't just Jesus that would save you, but it was actually through the, the works that you did. And so they were, there was this tension in Galatia where they, they felt they needed to still follow all the practices of the Old Testament law, but also follow the law of Jesus. And so there was this debate about whether or not someone could be a, a Gentile, which is really non-Jew, and have relationship with Jesus. And so throughout the book of Galatians, Paul talks about this and goes back and forth, tries to convince these people through his letters that you don't have to do all of those things through the grace of Jesus, through the sacrifice that he's made for you, you're able to receive this salvation. And, and he goes back and forth through many chapters. And at the end of Galatians, he shares about this new freedom, but he gives people a responsibility, which is where we pick up in Galatians 5.13. Paul writes, for you've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out, be aware of destroying one another. The title of my message today is, I am free to serve. Of course, it'd be the American that comes and talks about freedom. <laughs> but how many, how, how many of you know that uh, our freedom, as Paul talks about, we often use it to fulfill our selfishness. When I was a kid, uh, my, my brother and I, we went to the dollar store and I was probably around four years old. And my brother, the way I describe him, you know, sometimes pastor's kids maybe have had this rap where uh, they don't always follow what they're supposed to do because they grow up in church, they kind of poke, poke the line and toe the line. And truly my brother and I, we've never had time where we've walked away from the Lord, we've always served him. And so people say, well, what were you like as a pastor's kid? Oh, was, I was a great kid. However, when you compare me to my brother, I look horrible because he was perfect. He did nothing wrong. He was the oldest. He always did everything. I mean, he, the conviction that he had on his life was, I mean, even if he was thinking about, maybe thinking about sinning, he would confess, right? And I didn't have that same uh, conviction that he did. And so we're at the dollar store and my, my dad gave us each $2. And so we could each buy two things. Well, me as my uh, manipulator at the time, of course, I've, I've outgrown it. Um, I said, hey, Connor, why don't you give me one of your dollars so then I can get three things because you only need one, right? Normally that'd be something an older brother would do to the younger brother, but I had convinced him. And so him being as, as kind as he was, he, he probably knew it wasn't a very good deal, but he decided, eh, whatever, that's fine. I only need one thing, so I'll give him three. So we get up to the counter and my dad looks at us and he sees that I have three items and Connor only has one. And he said, what's going on here? And Connor said, well, Logan asked if he could have one of my dollars and so I gave him one of his. And I remember how furious my dad was because he said, no, 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 Logan, you don't get to decide where the dollars go. I've given you the $2 to, to take and to, to, to get something with it. And you can't just take Connor just because you manipulated him. And that was a theme throughout our childhood as I did whatever I could to manipulate. But as we got older and stronger, and he's three years older than me, he was able to uh, solve those problems by force in the future. 
But Paul says, don't use freedom to satisfy your sinful nature and your selfishness. But how many of you know we're selfish? You know, you, you, you see a toddler and immediately, what do they say? Mine. They learn that word. It's their favorite word. Mine, mine, that's mine. It's like, well, that's not yours. You didn't pay for it. I remember when my dad would take us to get some food and maybe we'd go to McDonald's as a kid and he'd say, oh, can I have a fry? And, no, 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 these are my fries. You can't have anything. But of course he paid for them, but we're selfish. We compete with others, right? We say, oh, we want to be better than you. How can I be better? Some people are competitive in here. You're competitive about getting to the car first after church. It's like, oh, I beat you. I did it. I sat, I got in the front. I did whatever it is. We're competitive or we compare ourselves to other people, right? Well, based on where I'm at in my life or based on the house that I live in or the car that I drive or the kids, how, how well behaved our kids are, right? We compare ourselves and it's kind of a measuring stick that we make towards others in our own life. We, we don't necessarily compare ourselves to God's example because that's far too hard, right, to reach. So we compare ourselves to other people. And, and how am I doing compared to the people at work? How am I doing compared to the people that I surround myself with? And another thing that we do is we covet, right? In that comparison and in that competitiveness, we covet what other people have. Well, if only I had, right? And in our comparison, the way that we make excuses is actually sometimes through our coveting, right? And so we, we make excuses about, well, the reason why I'm not as involved is because the reason I don't exactly have a house. I could never host a small group because my house isn't big enough, right? Have you seen these prices in Vancouver? No way. I could never do that. Well, I don't have that gift. I could never go up and, and do announcements. I could never be used in that way. I, I don't have a good enough smile, right? We make so many excuses and we compare ourselves to other people, but that's our selfishness. And we have this freedom and, and God's given us this freedom that Paul talks about is we're free to live in Christ. We're free to share our faith. We're free to, to, to go after all the things that God has for us, but we make these excuses because of our selfishness. And you know, how many of you know that in the world we live in, it's all about being the greatest. Social media is about being the greatest. The more followers we have, the, the more likes that we get, the more comments that we get, people that are satisfying us more over and over. But what does Jesus say? Matthew 23, he says, the greatest among you must be a servant. And that's the call for us today is how can we use our freedom to continue to serve? But how many of you know that serving isn't always easy? Jesus made that example for us, right? He, he, he shows us that it's difficult, it's challenging. G even Jesus was rejected, right? Even Jesus had people that cast him out of town and said, get out of here. So how much more should that happen to us who are not perfect? But serving's not easy, and it reminds me of the time where my wife and I went on our first date, and I thought that this would be perfect. It'd be an amazing, amazing date. And so we go, and I, I drive up to her parents' house. It was over the summer. We were home from... A college and I go to her parents house and her, her dad and her brother are out there working in the driveway and they are both Italian and they have gold chains on and um, it was a hundred degrees Fahrenheit I don't know exactly what that is Celsius but very hot and I go up and all right so I walk up to them hey I'm, I'm taking out Mac on a date and they just both stared at me and I'm like I know that you wore those black tank tops just to intimidate me but they were very tan too. And you know me, it's like my skin is a little more fair. So I'm already just feeling that comparison and judgment. And, you know, I'm, I was like, oh yeah, Corey, her brother. Oh, you know who I am. He's like, I don't remember. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> awesome. So I'm trying to serve her. And so we, we go and, and finally after about 20 minutes of them peppering me with questions. And at the time I, I was working in fashion and uh, her dad asked me, what do you do for work? I said, I'm an entrepreneur. He's like, ah, okay, yeah, sure. So you have no money, great, perfect. So he said, hey, two things you should know about me. I don't like to be lied to and I don't like surprises. I'm like, wow, this is going really well. <laughs> so he said, where are you guys going tonight? I said, well, it's a surprise. <laughs> and he looked at me and I just looked right into my soul. Okay, fine, we're going to an art festival downtown, I'm sorry. So we go down there and we eat at this restaurant and of course the cook was sick and the food took 40 minutes to get there and we're, we're you know, we had, texted throughout that week and hung out a couple times before our official first date. So we're staring at each other across the table. And I remember asking, I said, what's your favorite movie? And she goes, I don't like movies. <laughs> I thought, this is it. It's over. <laughs> it's over at the beginning. 
So we, we walk out and I thought, all right, the, the food, we, we got done with this and you know, we walk out into this art festival and we start walking around. Of course, it's 100 degrees out. Again, it's like, what is that, 37 maybe, something like that. So very hot, we're sweating, walking around. And I, had wore, I got a new pair of Vans. I'm wearing Vans today, I love Vans. But I got a new pair of Vans and they were the low Vans and I wore a no-show socks because that was kind of the look at the time. But the socks started riding down and, and the Vans started uh, hit, cutting into my heels. So after about 15 minutes of walking around this art festival, I'm starting to limp. And Mac realizes this, and what's wrong? I said, oh, nothing, until I look down at my white vans, and on the back of them, they're full of blood because I have been bleeding from my heels. And so I'm, I'm actually hurting so bad that I can barely walk anymore. And we didn't have our car because it was far away from walking. And so we actually took an Uber to Target so that we could get some new socks. And I remember thinking, this, this girl's got to think just, I'm, the, I'm like the worst person ever. I'm not cool. The food took a long time. I'm, my feet are bleeding. I was trying my best. And I remember she took my bloody socks after putting on my new socks. She took my bloody socks and she put them in her purse. And I thought, what are you doing? I said, why are you putting them in your purse? She said, oh, I'll wash them. And this is exactly what I thought in that moment. I said, she either feels so bad for me that she's just trying to do whatever she can to make me feel better, or I'm gonna marry this woman. <laughs> of course I did the latter. But she goes, she, she, she takes care of me, we go, we get these socks, and I just thought, wow, what a person that would do that. That would take these socks, that would wash them, that would take them, I was like, you could throw them away. And she served me, and she took care of me, and then I served her, I got ice cream, right? A way to a woman's heart is ice cream. I learned that is, so I've learned a few things in marriage. I remember the first year in marriage, I was talking to uh, one of my mentors and he said, how's marriage going? I said, oh, it's going really well. I said, I just learned how selfish I am. He said, that's true. I said, the problem is I haven't done anything about it yet. <laughs> All right, true. But she has taught me how to serve and from the first date and on, she served and I've done my best to serve as well. But serving is not always easy. But I think the Bible talks a lot about how we can serve others and how we can bring lift to them. We talk about this often, bringing lift, right? Bringing levity. We've been around uh, Christians before who forgot that joy is one of the fruits of the spirit, right? They almost seem miserable to serve God. They seem miserable to follow after him. And, and you ask them, well, the grace you've been given, right? You've been saved, but, but we miss that. And so the most simple way to serve is firstly to be an encourager. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just in fact you are doing. Encourage another and build, build each other up. I don't know about you, but I've never felt too encouraged. I've never had to say to someone in my life, you know what? Stop it. Stop complimenting me. Stop telling me that I'm doing a great job. Just stop it. It's just too much. I've never done that. There's a friend, a couple who's friends of ours in our life, and every single morning he texts me. Every morning he texts me a long prayer and encouragement. He gets up way earlier than I do, but I wake up to a text. He texts at 5 a.m., and he says, every morning it's an encouragement. He's someone who's a part of our church, a deacon at our church. Without fail, every morning I get this text. And this morning he texted, praying for you, preaching today, encouraging you. He sent us a Venmo with some money for our vacation. I mean, I didn't say, oh my goodness, I can't, I don't, this is horrible. This is horrible. He encourages me every single day. And I, I'd ask you, who is that person for you? And who are you, who, who can you be that person for, right? As Bish and Haley are stepping into this new job, you know what they need more of is encouragement. I guarantee you, they'll not say, you know what? We, we, we feel overly encouraged. As a pastor, I can promise you, that they're never gonna say that. Of course there's problems that happen. I didn't get the parking spot that I wanted or somebody took my seat in church. Can you believe that? Or now we're at two services. I, my kids don't see their friends and they come up. Hey, I, I, I wish we didn't do that. Or that's, that's not the way we always have done it here. That's not the way my bacon's cooked, right? It's easy to make excuses, but what's even simpler but often missed is to encourage. We encourage others and the thing that sometimes we miss is encouraging others actually encourages us, right? The people who've forgotten about joy, that forgotten about the fruit of the spirit, what they don't realize is that it's actually to help yourself. 
He who delights himself in the Lord fills him up. He who draws near to Jesus, Jesus draws back near to us. He who encourages one another will also be encouraged. That's what scripture says. So I would encourage us to be encouragers, right? To be lifters in this season of, of newness and excitement and opportunity. It's, hey, let's encourage, encourage people's gifts. When you see something, say something, right? You've heard that before. But how many times have I thought something? Oh, wow, they, they look awesome today, but I've not said anything about it. That was a great message, but I, uh, I wouldn't tell them, of course. That, that was a, a great opportunity using your gifts. Be an encourager, and that's something that Paul encourages us to do. But another thing that we can do is we can be available, right? Making time for people. How many of you know people that have said, uh, we should get together? We should get coffee, or oh, let's get the kids together. That'd be awesome. And every time you see them at church, or every time you see them out at the supermarket, or every time you see them at the mall or at your workplace, you're always bringing up, you know what? We got to get together. Three years later, we've never done it, but I, we gotta do that. Why don't we do it? It's because we don't make time, right? We all have the same amount of time in the day, but it's how we use it. And so let's be people that are available. And Billy Graham said, we hurt people by being too busy, too busy to notice their needs, too busy to drop that note of comfort or encouragement or assurance of love, too busy to listen when someone needs to talk, too busy to care. May we not as people who are in a major area, Minneapolis isn't quite as big as Vancouver is, but a major city, there's jobs, it's, it's, it's hustle, it's go, it's, it's let's make something for ourselves. Let us not be too busy for people. Let us not be too busy where we don't have enough time. I don't have enough time to serve. I don't have enough time. You know, maybe you're watching online. I don't have enough time to be there. I just, I don't have enough time. There's too many sports. There's too many things. There's too, too much work that I have to do. But who are the people that we miss that are walking by that maybe need to be in this room, that maybe need to be invited, that maybe we need to do life with and share? And Jesus, he didn't take a tram or a car. He walked places. Now, of course, the technology wasn't there, but we don't hear stories or read that he was taken by horse and chariot. We see that Jesus walked through towns and he made time for people and people touched the hem of his garment and were healed and people asked him questions, sometimes difficult ones, and he was prepared for a response. So let's be people that we make time and maybe there's people in your life that you go, you know what, I know that I haven't made time for them or there will be people now that you've heard this message, oh my goodness, I need to make time for them. I need to rearrange my calendar. Why, why would we from Minneapolis spend thousands of dollars to fly out here and come be a part? Why? Because we, we wanna be a part of this. We wanna be encouraging. We wanna bring lift. We wanna make time and rearrange our calendar so that we can bring something to the table. And I believe we all have gifts to bring, but I believe sometimes people don't bring their gifts because they haven't made time for it. So let's be a church that makes time for people. Let's be a church that makes time for our leaders, makes time to encourage. Another thing we can do is be prepared. And of course, there's a difference between being prepared and being available, right? How many of you have ever had somebody that has helped you? Maybe you're moving and, and they're available. They showed up but they're not very prepared. Maybe they, they showed up with the wrong shoes or they happen to use the bathroom about 80% of the time that you're moving. Oh, I, just, I know I just got here, but uh, I gotta use the bathroom or, you know, they're just not prepared. They're talking all the time. You know, we're here to move, right? But you're just talking to all the movers, right? You're actually, you're actually hurting. You're a net negative to being here. <laughs> we need you to be a positive. At least grab a box while you talk. We once went to a wedding and uh, we were looking at the table list. I don't know if this ever happened to anyone here, but we were looking at the table list and we didn't see our name. We had gone to the, the ceremony and we, we were convinced that we were invited, but we got to the reception and it was a smaller reception, an invite only reception. And you know, we went and we didn't see our name and we really thought we were invited, but it was really awkward because everyone was in their, their tables and we're kind of walking around and we kind of felt like, okay, they, they clearly weren't prepared for us. And so we just said, we're gonna go because this is really awkward. We feel so bad about being here. And as we're on our way out, the bride and groom walk in. So then we're, okay, now we're here and we're making it even more awkward. And she comes up, she goes, have you found your table yet? Uh, no, I don't, were we invited to be here? What had happened was they forgot to put one of the table assignments out. And so we were there thinking, we're not supposed to be here, but they just forgotten something. 
And how many times, maybe it's at church or maybe it's in your life, that we've forgotten to clarify what needs to happen, right? Somebody walks into Life Church and maybe they don't know where to go. Oh, we forgot to put our signs out today. Sorry. Or if you walk into a restaurant and there's no host to seat you, what, what do I do? Where do I go? Oh, well, seat yourself. Well, there was no sign. There was no one to tell me. You weren't prepared for me. And so as believers, we want to be prepared. We don't want to be like the wedding that doesn't have the table assignment where people walk in and feel, am I supposed to be here? We want people to be reminded that we're prepared for you. We're ready for you. And this isn't just in church. This is, we're pre I'm prepared to pray. I'm prepared to pray. I'm prepared to pray whenever, wherever. I'm prepared to, to use my hands to do something. I'm prepared to bring my gifts. I'm prepared. 2 Timothy 4.2 says, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. What that means is sometimes we need to call something out. We need to correct something. Other times we need to encourage. We need to exhort. We need to lift up. We need to be prepared. But what do we do that with? With patience and teaching? We don't want to be those people that say, hey, be prepared. Be prepared. Someone that comes on stage and yells at you, right? Hopefully you don't think that of me. Be prepared, right? How can we be prepared for the people that we know that God wants us to reach? How can we be prepared for the neighbor, for the person that's going to show up to Life Church for the first time? How can we be prepared? Have you ever been sick when other people are sick? When you're kind of sick together and neither one can help each other? There was a time where I had a toothache and I was coming home from a trip and I got home. And how many of you know that tooth pain is just, it's one of the hardest things ever. It's, it's like back pain and tooth pain, you're just totally debilitated. So my, my tooth was just hurting so bad, and I started Googling my symptoms. It was never a good idea. <laughs> I'd found out that my wisdom teeth were certainly infected and that I probably had several other mouth diseases and was probably going to die in the next seven days. <laughs> so it was 3 a.m., and I just couldn't bear it anymore. And I, I asked Mac, I said, Mac, could you go down? Could you give me some Advil so I can take this and just get rid of this tooth pain? So she stands up really fast, gets out of bed because she hears me say this, and then she passes out. <laughs> so it's three in the morning. My tooth is just killing me, and my wife is just passed out. So now I have to take care of her. And then she, she whips up. I just passed out. <laughs> yeah, you did. So I'm, I'm here trying to figure out, okay, am I now the one who needs to serve, or am I still asking her to take care of me because my mouth is throbbing, and she just passed out. I think we're okay. She goes, oh, let me check the bathroom. And check the bathroom and I said you know what let me check the bathroom you wait here you sit down so I come back and she goes I'll go downstairs she turns around really fast she passes out again <laughs> then she's face down on the bed so I'm like all right I probably have a few minutes here to go downstairs and get something but I probably need to serve her now so I grab her by the side and now me who needed to be served I'm actually now walking my wife down the stairs of our home trying to get her a glass of water and take care of her, but sometimes we're sick and we're not healthy enough to serve, right? Sometimes in church, we need to get healthy, right? But sometimes we wait too long to get healthy. There are things in our life that we know we need to work on, that we need to deal with, that we need to take care of in order so that we can serve. And maybe you're like me and maybe you have pain or maybe you're like her and it's a quick thing and, oh my goodness, I wasn't prepared for this. But I hope that we as a church can be a church that can be prepared for people and say, hey, I'm prepared. Why? Because I'm healthy. As Bish said, I'm ready to, to pour out. Why? Because I've been filled. We're, we're able to pour out because of the filling of what the Holy Spirit does, of what God gives us. But when we're empty, it's really hard to serve. Hey, could you come over and could you help me with this? Ah, well, I'm sorry. My car doesn't have any gas. I don't have any money to fill it. I'm, I'm unable to serve. I'm unable to help. So often people, uh, they, they accuse Christians of this, right? Oh, sure, you're, you're, you preach the gospel, you share the gospel, you love it, but when you're needed, where are you? Where have you been? And I hope that we as a church are not to be that way, that we would be a church that's prepared for people. And the final two points, and keys can come up here. But number four is be vigilant. In Galatians, Paul mentions... But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Be aware of destroying one another. The world is divided, but the church can also be divided too. 
The church can fall prey to the same attacks of the enemy. What do they want to do? They want to turn us against each other politically. They want to turn us against each other with everything. It's, it's always a debate. Why? And probably so that they can distract us from the evils that they're actually doing, right? But in the church, it's so easy to fall victim to that dividing. Well, that's not the way that we used to do it. Or, or this is how I would like to be received. This is how I would like to do this. And we divide and we bicker. And did you see what they posted on social media? Did you see what, what their daughter was wearing? Did you see this? It's so easy to become victims of this. And it's not that there's not sin. It's not that there's not mistakes. But, but what does he talk about? Do it with patience. But, but we're divided, and the devil's going to do everything he can to divide and distract his church. You know, he's actually fine with us meeting here. He's fine with it, as long as we don't go out there and bring what we have here. He's fine if we're divided. If we're, if we're arguing whether or not the floor color is right, or we're arguing whether or not the lyrics on the screen are in the right font, or we're arguing whether or not whatever it is, the devil's fine with that. Sure, stay divided, because the millions of people out there are never going to receive the message when we're divided against each other. A divided church cannot heal a nation, but a united church can. The message of Jesus is strong enough. It's good enough for every single person, but if we're too distracted looking inward, and I'd encourage even in this new season as, as this new thing, there's, there may be changes that happen. Bish and Haley are different, but they're God's choice right now, right? What is God asking them to do? How can you support them? How can you be around them? How can you serve? How can you serve in this way? Maybe you're here and you'd say, I've never served before, but this is a great time to do it. It's a great time to step in. But be vigilant. Be, be aware of the things that the enemy is going to distract. All of a sudden, right now, when you say, hey, this is maybe when I need you the most, God, this is the time where the devil's going to attack, and maybe he's going to attack your family. Maybe he's going to attack your job. Maybe he's going to attack your neighborhood. He's going to fight against you hard because he knows if you're, if you're thinking about, well, maybe I should step out and serve. Maybe I should use my gifts. Maybe I should maybe do something that I haven't before. That's when the devil is going to go, wait, that's where I don't want you to do something, and he's going to attack. So be vi vigilant. Be on guard. And the final thing, the final way that we can serve, not just at this church, but in our world, is to be reminded be reminded of what Jesus has done. 1 Samuel 12, 24 says, Above all, fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. Sometimes we forget our testimony. Sometimes we forget what God has done. We forget what he saved us from. The life that we used to live, the bondage we used to be in, the addiction we used to have, the situation that used to control us. We're thankful for that freedom and, and oftentimes as new believers or after the miracle happens, we're bold and we're excited and we're encouraged and we're out there, but we let it fade away because we forget to remember what God has done in our life. But his death and his resurrection, it wasn't for a moment, it was for an eternity. It was for you and for me. And so help us not to forget. We can't forget what he's done. The way we serve, the way we smile with joy, to encourage, to be prepared, to make time. Why do we do this? It's because of what he's done for us. And it's the simplest message of all, but it's the message of the gospel that Jesus made a way for us, right? We talk about it often in church, and many of us in this room have experienced that salvation and experienced that freedom and experienced the peace that the Spirit brings. But sometimes we act like we've forgotten. If we know we've been saved from death, what would we do? If we know we've been saved from addiction, from, from a life of bondage, what would we do? How would we act? How would we respond if we truly believed that the king of the universe was in this room with us, that empowers us, that strengthens us, that emboldens us so that we can serve and build this church? How would we respond if we didn't forget what he's done? A lot of people, though, make excuses, but not me. That's for Pastor Bish. 
It's for others on the team. That's for the leadership. That's for those who've been here five years or longer. Whatever the timeline is, we, we make excuses that, you know, it's just not me. But how many of you know the Bible is full of people that have this phrase tied to them? Who would have thought? Who would have thought that the shepherd boy would be a king? Who would have thought that Gideon would lead the army? Who would have thought that Esther would stand up to a king and save her people? Who would have thought that Rahab, a prostitute, would be used to save the city? Who would have thought? Who would have thought that you in Ladner, Tawasin, Delta, Vancouver, who would have thought that you'd be used for those things? Who would have thought that this church in a season of transition actually is believing for greater things? Who would have thought that this church would be used to reach this city? Who would have thought that you in this room would bring your gifts to the table? Not the gifts that you've done for yourself, but the gifts that God has given you. The church needs your gifts, not in a selfish way, but in a way to help others, in a way to bring others in, in a way to show others the love of Jesus Christ. Every single one of us has something to bring. It may look different, right? Not all of us can sing on the worship team. Thank, thank God for that, right? Some of us, it wouldn't be good if we had a microphone in our hands. Not all of us can serve in kids, but all of us can do something to say, God, what are you calling me to do? Who would have thought that I would be used? Who would have thought that they would be used? Who would have thought that this church in this place, God would have his hand upon to reach this city, to reach our neighbors, to do great things. The late Tim Keller, he said this, for indeed grace is the key to it all. It's not our lavish good deeds that procure salvation, but God's lavish love and mercy. That is why the poor are as acceptable before God as the rich. It's the generosity of God, the freeness of his salvation that lays the foundation for the society of justice for all. It's in, it's in that freedom that we get to serve. There isn't anything we have to do. There isn't anything we have to do to get Jesus to love us. There isn't anything we have to do aside from accept the gift of salvation, but in our freedom, as Paul talks about, in our freedom, let us not do that to, to take care of ourselves. Let us not let church be something that we receive from every time where we come. What do you got for me, pastor? What do you got for me, worship team? What do you got for me? Teach my kids this. No, let us be a church that we all come together and say, let us bring our gifts. Let us be a part of this. Let us show what unity can be to a world that's so divided. Let us show what a church can look like. Let's not let our freedom satisfy our selfish desires, but what to serve one another in love. We don't do this to pat ourselves on the back or have a great social media following or say, look at our church. We do this to say, look at our King. Look at who he is and what he has done for me. So Lord, I pray right now for every person in this room, for myself here on the stage, for Pastor Bish and Haley, for all the team, the leaders who've been here, God, I pray that we would double down. Say, God, it's because of your grace. It's because of your goodness. It's because of your love. That's why I serve you. It's not to impress my neighbor. It's not to impress the person next to me at church, but it's to serve you, the King, who's, who's given your life for me. I prayed we, we'd remember that, we'd, we'd hold to that, God. We'd bring our gifts to the table, that we wouldn't be too busy, that we wouldn't be unprepared, that we wouldn't be too inward focused, but we'd recognize that because of the gift, because of the freedom, because of the blessings that you've given to us, we get to serve you and we get to build your church. What an opportunity it is that you have asked us to be co-laborers with you, to do this together, to build your church, the church of Jesus Christ. And I pray that we would be builders of your church and bring our gifts. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You can keep, yeah, thank, can we give God some praise? In a moment, I'm gonna hand it off to Pastor Bish, but can we bow our heads one more time and close our eyes? And maybe there's someone in this place, I don't know, obviously the first time me 
sharing here at your church, but maybe there's someone in this place and maybe you'd say, I'm far from God. I don't even know why I showed up. I don't know why I'm here. But I don't know that I have the grace to serve because I don't know that I've ever even received grace. Or maybe I've been going through the motions, but I truly know that I'm not following Jesus. That I don't have that relationship that you talk about. That I, I can't even do any of these five things because I can't be reminded of salvation. I've not received salvation. Or maybe you remember it from a day before when you were younger or that time in your life, but you don't have relationship with Jesus. I'd love to give an opportunity for someone in this room to say yes to him and to receive salvation. And maybe, maybe there's no one, but maybe you're here and maybe you say, that's me. I know that I wanna receive this gift of salvation. If that's you in this place, no one's looking around, but you say, that's me. I, I, need, to, I need to receive Jesus for the first time or I need to do this again. If you're in this place, would you simply just lift up a hand and say, yeah, that's me, that's me. Yes, yes. Anyone else? Amazing. You can put your hands down. And I'm gonna ask that you'd repeat a prayer after me. And I'm gonna ask that the whole church would join in in repeating this prayer. And it's not magic words that save us, but it's a heart posture that says, Lord, I wanna, I wanna serve you and I wanna change my life to follow you. So would you just repeat after me? Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin and all that I've done wrong, but I receive your gift, the free gift of salvation. Help me to serve you, help me to love you, and help me to live for you for the rest of my life. Give me the strength to do that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Church, can we celebrate all God's doing in this place? It's amazing. Thank you.